welcome um, all of you to the 2020 Charles uh, Sawyer Distinguished Lecture. This is um, a lecture that is um, voted on by the trainees of the Laboratory of Neuroendocrinology. Um, these include postdocs, graduate students uh, of the labs that I'll show you that are members of the Laboratory of Neuroendocrinology. And it's named in Sawyer. Tom um, um, was the founder of um, neurochronology um, at UCLA and one of the people who defined what neurochronology was by establishing that the brain regulated ovulation reproductive behaviors. And it's very interesting that Tom, who was a pioneer and ahead of his time in many, many aspects, um, was mostly interested in how reproductive reproduction worked in females. We now know that that's, that's an important area that NIH is exploring the sex differences in, in brain and, and other parts of the body. But Tom was, was from the beginning very interested in how this process worked in uh, females. Um, the, these are three papers that, that I consider to be seminal papers of, of Tom Sawyer. Uh, and you have to remember that when Tom Sawyer started doing this work, we had no idea that the brain controlled ovulation, that the brain controlled the anterior pituitary. And it was through research that, that Tom did and others obviously did that we established that the hypothalamus through a uh, humoral, that is a bloodborne uh, set of releasing factors controlled the anterior pituitary. In addition, Tom uh, was very interested in reproductive behavior, and he showed that by implanting uh, estradiol into the ventral medial nucleus of the rabbits, that he could induce uh, lordosis behavior. And this is a field that was, was plowed, I think, to great uh, advantage by uh, Don Pfaff over the years. But, but the, the initial experiments were done by Kawakami and Sawyer back in 1959. And he was very, very interested uh, in, in puberty, which is, of course, the signal uh, that the animal is reproductively um, competent. And so the first experiments on that, the advancement of puberty, were done by Victor Ramirez and, and Charles Sawyer. One of the other things that Sawyer did uh, was he influenced a generation, maybe two generations, of neuroendocrinologists throughout the world. They uh, trained with, with uh, Sawyer, both as graduate students and as postdocs. And uh, when I had the, the privilege of, of uh, joining the faculty at UCLA, when I would go to international meetings, one of his postdocs or students would always ask how Dr. Sawyer was doing. Uh, this was in Japan, this was all over Europe and, and, and in the United States. So he had a profound effect on, on the field by training uh, people who would become leaders in the field. And you don't have to take uh, my word for it. Um, the 1977 Nobel Prize winners, Roger Gieman and Andrew Shalley, who shared the prize with Ro Rosalind Yalo, um, spoke of Tom very highly. Roger Gieman said, Charles H. Sawyer was one of the first contributors to the field of endocrinology to his fundamental studies of the function of the ovary and the brain mechanisms now known to be their ultimate regulators. He always asked the right questions or provided a clue to the right answer. And Andrew Shalley, uh, not a particularly good friend of Roger Gieman, they were competitors for, for, for this through uh, uh, about 20 years, said with deep admiration and friendship to Tom Sawyer, the number one pioneer in neuroendocrinology and the man who started the avalanche of progress on the hypothalamus. The other thing that Tom loved was he loved to teach gross anatomy. Uh, in fact, he gave the first lecture at UCLA in the newly formed medical school in 1951. And he was always um, on top of the latest trend in teaching aids. So here he is using 3D glasses with his students to make a point in, in gross anatomy. And he, um, 
at that time was was uh, for a while the chair of the anatomy department, which which has morphed over the years into the department of neurobiology, um, which uh, I chair. Uh, the other thing Tom uh, loved was international meetings, and it's probably it, it seems probably a little bit naive to us now, but Tom really believed in the international fellowship of science and scientists. And he loved going to international meetings. He loved interacting with, with people throughout the world. And so each year, the neurobiology department awards a Charles Sawyer Memorial Trial. Tom's uh, initial neuroendocrine group over the years morphed into what is now the laboratory of neuroendocrinology. Um, and here is a list of the faculty members uh, of the 2020 version of the laboratory of, of neuroendocrinology. The laboratory of neuroendocrinology was uh, initiated by Roger Gorski, who led it for many years, and then Ar Arnold became its director. And uh, upon his retirement, I am the, the director of the laboratory of neuroendocrinology. And as I mentioned, um, each year, the trainees of the Laboratory of Neuroendocrinology vote on and pick the Sawyer Lecturer. Um, and this started back in 1998, much to Tom's unhappiness. He really didn't want to have anything that put him front and center. In 1998, we uh, picked A. Tarasawa, a former postdoc with, with Tom to be the inaugural uh, Sawyer Lecturer. And if you look through the list and you know anything about neuroendocrinology, this is a list of the uh, main players of neuroendocrinology over the years. Uh, and we have a rule in the laboratory of neuroendocrinology that the Sawyer lectureship goes to someone outside of UCLA. We broke that rule last year to honor um, our own Art Arnold. Uh, but in uh, 2020, we're back to honoring Larry Young, who's our uh, lecturer this year. Uh, Larry Young is a the, uh, William Timmy professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Emory University. And as you can see, he's the director of uh, many uh, centers uh, at, at Emory. And, and he, is, he has spent his uh, entire career after doing a postdoc with Tom Insel uh, at Emory. Uh, Larry uh, began his career uh, at the University of Georgia and then moved to Texas to do his PhD with David Cruz. And you'll notice that David Cruz was on the list of Sawyer lectures uh, in the past. And for Larry, uh, at least the way I think of, of his career, that it all started with the vol. And uh, he helped discover that there was a link between oxytocin and bonding in a monogamous uh, prairie vole. And uh, subsequently, uh, they, he and his group discovered that there were more oxytocin receptors in this monogamous prairie vole than in the uh, more promiscuous uh, montane voles. And over the years, Larry has, has plowed this field to, to great advantage. He has characterized the role of oxytocin and, and also vasopressin in regulating neural processing of social signals and social attachment using a variety of genetic and comparative neuroethological uh, tools. This work has led to the development of neural modeling of social bonding, uh, which shares many features with addiction. Uh, he has, he has um, been very involved in using this fundamental knowledge um, regulating social cognition in animals to develop novel treatments for psychiatric disorders with social impairment. And as we'll learn about today, uh, is applying it to uh, understanding of autism. Larry has authored over 160 papers and some 90 chapters and reviews. He is the co-author of a uh, popular book, The Chemistry Between Us, Love, Sex, and the Science of Attachment. He has won many honors, uh, including the Frank uh, Beach Award from the Society of Behavioral Neuroendocrinology. He is the member of the American College of Neuro uh, 
uh, psychopharmacology and was elected as a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So uh, without further ado, I uh, give you Larry Young, who is going to update us on his fascinating research into oxytocin and autism. So Larry, uh, welcome to UCLA, at least figuratively, and um, we are very anxious to hear your lecture. Okay, thank you for that great introduction. Uh, let me see if I can get my share screen working. Um, it really is a tremendous honor to be um, able to give this lecture, to be chosen by the, the trainees of the Laboratory of Neuroendocrinology, and uh, especially uh, in this lecture named after uh, the great leaders, one of the great leaders of neuroendocrinology, Tom Sawyer. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, the work I've been doing now for 25 years here at Emory uh, on the neurobiology of social relationships. And uh, this picture here is a nice illustration of the strong uh, bonds that, that we have as humans. And I think everybody knows uh, how important these social relationships are. Uh, when these relationships are, are positive, they can lead to you know, good mental health, physical health. Uh, but when they're broken, they can also lead to um, physical and mental health issues. So, um, so I'm interested in the, I, I was a biochemistry major. I'm interested in the, the biochemistry of behaviors. I'm also interested in the evolution of behavior. So those are the two things that really drive my work. Evolution, where does diversity come from? And what are the chemicals involved? And um, if you look at these relationships, uh, some relationships that humans have, like this bond between a mother and an infant, it's evolutionarily very conserved. You'd find that across all mammalian species. Mothers bonded with their babies, take care of their babies, provide uh, nurture, nurturant to the offspring. But humans are also have some kinds of relationship that you don't see very often among mammals, and that's the relationship between these partners. So, um, you know, given the fact that this is evolutionarily very conserved, you might think that the neural mechanisms that generate this behavior would be similar in mice, as in rhesus macaques, as in humans. And so you can study something, study animals to, to, uh, to get at this neurochemistry. But what about this uh, bond here? Um, where did that come from? It's actually very rare. Only about 5% uh, of mammal species have the, an attachment that happens between mates. And the other 95 species, mating occurs, and then the female raises the offspring by herself. So how can you begin to get to the neurochemistry of this behavior? Uh, you can learn a little bit in humans by putting them in brain scanners and looking at brain activation and functional connectivity and things of that nature. But if you really want to get down to the chemistry, mm -hmm. the neuroendocrinology of behaviors, uh, you've got to have animal models. And these are the animals that I study. These are called prairie voles. These guys are they're socially monogamous, which means that you know once they mate, they stick together for the rest of their life, mostly. Um, Often if one dies, about 80% of the cases, the animal, the other one's, the partner does not take on a new, a new partner. Now they're, they're socially monogamous, but they're not genetically monogamous. So sometimes they will have an affair, um, extra pair copulation. And maybe that makes them an even a better model for human behavior than if they were strictly monogamous. So uh, these, these animals, what I've been studying in the last uh, 25 years or so. And now if you, even among voles, there's many different species of voles and not all voles are monogamous and not all prairie voles are monogamous either. About 60% of males never take a female partner. Uh, they may mate, but they don't bond. So there's a lot of variation in behavior. And um, so one interesting question for me is how did this monogamy evolve? The ancestral state was probably not monogamous. So how do you get this new kind of behavior? And I happen to think that uh, when monogamy has evolved, it has evolved many times independently over the course of evolution, that probably the best way to do it is to tweak systems that are involved in this mother-infant bonding so that the bonding can be more generalized to your sexual partners as well. And I think, I believe that this is what happens that you have, you have this neural systems that's very highly conserved across all species and then they can just be tweaked by evolution to create other kinds of social attachments. And one of the reasons that we think this is because of the a role for this molecule, oxytocin, in bonding. Uh, so you guys all know oxytocin is involved in parturition, uterus contractions during birth, and after the baby's born, it's involved in uh, milk ejection reflex. Uh, 
but what we also know now that it's also involved in turning on maternal behavior so that females want to take care of their offspring. And this is work done many years ago, late 1970s, early 80s, where uh, it was shown that um, by Court Peterson that in rats, female rats, if they're virgins, they don't like pups. They avoid pups. They maybe attack pups. They, they, are, they find them very aversive. They stink and they squeal. But when they go through the hormones of pregnancy, something happens in their brain. The brain is transformed so that they then want to become a, a mother and want to care for offspring. And there's a classic study done in the 60s where they trained female rats who had given birth to press a lever to get pups delivered down a chute. And they would press the lever hundreds of times to get hundreds of pups piled up. So uh, the same stimulus that was once aversive becomes irresistible in these rats. Now rats don't really bond specifically with their babies. They sort of bond with their nest because they're born not able to walk around very much. But if you look in other species like sheep, Barry Caverne and Keith Kendrick did this classic work showing that when, you know, when a lamb is born, of course they can walk around pretty much immediately and a female has to bond with her lamb. And oxytocin is involved in that bonding process too. You can actually take a female who is not given birth, uh, give her the proper estrogen and progesterone, uh, and then uh, inject into her brain oxytocin and show her a foreign lamb and she'll bond with that foreign lamb. So this molecule has a really strong, powerful effect on inducing this mother-infant bonds. So what about the pair bond? So we know that uh, early work done by Sue Carter showed that when prairie voles mate, it's that mating that transforms their brain so that they bond with who they mated with. They don't have to mate. They can be just together and interact socially for a longer period of time, but mating does facilitate it. And she devised this test we call a partner preference test where you can, you know, you have the animals, you can allow them to mate or do optogenetic stimulation or any kind of manipulations at this point. And then you, give them a choice test. So here I'm il illustrating that we're testing the female. The male is on this side, the partner is on this side. He's tethered so he can move around this cage, but he can't go out. You have a novel male on this side. He can move around this cage, but can't go out. And we watch this for three hours. We see who she spends her time with. And if animals have pair bonded, they'll spend more than twice as much time with the partner than the stranger. And this is a video to illustrate that. In this case, this is a male. Uh, this is his female partner that he spent the night with last night. He's never seen this female. So we're going to see who he uh, prefers. And if you do this in most species like mice and rats, the male actually prefers the novel female. But prairie voles don't. So this prairie vole is going to go check out this novel female he's never seen before. And you'll see that he doesn't just ignore it. He actually tussles with her a little bit. They have a little fight. And now he's going to go over and uh, see his partner. And uh, you can see how he behaves very differently towards him. And so we can test large numbers of animals in this test with computer software that quantifies behavior immediately. And now we're doing things like deep lab cut uh, to, to quantify this pair bonding behavior. And so the first uh, mechanisms that were discovered were discovered by Sue Carter and Tom Mansell, who was collaborating on this. And they said, okay, since Oxytocin is involved in mother-infant bonding. Maybe oxytocin is involved in this pair bonding. So they took animals and they cannulated them because oxytocin doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. And they either gave them CSF or gave them oxytocin and allowed them to cohabitate for six hours. And they found that if the animals received oxytocin, they would show a partner preference. Not only that, so not only can you induce a, a partner preference with oxytocin, if you block the oxytocin receptors with an antagonist and you let the animals mate, the CSF group will show a partner preference. Whereas if you block the receptors, they will not. So uh, this was the, the classic work showing that oxytocin was critically involved. Vasopressin is also important in males. We'll talk about, I won't talk about that this time, but oxytocin is important for both males and females. So it's part of that nurturing bond. And, um, so I, I got really interested in these voles when I was a grad student and I read about the fact that not all voles are the same. There are different species of voles like prairie voles I've been telling you about. Not only are they monogamous, but they're highly social. They crave social contact. So they have high levels of social reward. Uh, 
Uh, but then if you look at meadow voles or montane voles, they're solitary. They prefer to be by themselves and they mate, but they don't form bonds. Actually, these, these meadow voles, when they have babies, the mother takes care of them by themselves and then she abandons them after about two weeks. So there's something very fundamentally different about their social brain that gives them these different behaviors. And um, so you might think, well, if oxytocin is creating this bond, maybe prairie voles have more oxytocin. And that turns out not to be the case. If you stain the brain for oxytocin fibers or cells, you don't really see differences in, in a peptide. But if you stain the brain for the receptors, you see really dramatic differences. So this is just going through one slice of the brain, an area that has the nucleus accumbens and the prefrontal cortex. And you can see that prairie voles have really uh, more, much more receptors in the nucleus accumbens in particular, but also in the prefrontal cortex than the metal voles. And we know that these two areas are important because if you in, infuse oxytocin receptor antagonist into either the prefrontal cortex or to the nucleus accumbens, the animals, they mate just fine, but after mating, they don't form a bond. Infuse the same antagonist into the caudate putamen, they mate and they form a bond. So it was through these kinds of site-specific infusions of antagonists that we began to, to work out the circuitry of this pair bonding. And we're getting more and more sophisticated at doing that now. Um, but so the nucleus accumbens, as you know, is part of the dopamine, mesolimic dopamine reward pathway. It's involved in addiction. So um, we also know that dopamine is important for pair bonding. So there's a lot of commonalities between pair bonding and addiction um, that I'll talk about later. But this is one of the coolest things to me about this oxytocin receptor system. If you look at steroid receptors, they're very highly conserved in their expression from fish to reptiles to mammals to humans. So there's very highly conserved expression profiles. But even if you just look among rodents, you see very uh, robust species differences in receptor distribution. So this is a mouse and you can see there's no, virtually no receptor binding in the mouse. There are some receptors there that are involved in social reward, but they're not synthesized there. So there's something fundamentally, something fundamental about the oxytocin receptor gene that gives it evolutionarily, evolutionary plasticity so that it can move around across species. And I think that this is a, a means of generating diversity in social behaviors. Um, so I've been really interested in like understanding what is it about this gene that gives it these species differences in, in distribution. Um, and it's not just among rodents. If you look at primates, so these are marmosets. And this is also staining for the receptors. And you can say that like the prairie vole, the nucleus accumbens is loaded with oxytocin receptors. If you look in rhesus macaques, so marmosets are monogamous. Rhesus macaques are not monogamous. They have virtually no oxytocin receptors in their nucleus accumbens. So there is a sort of a pattern that may not be 100% accurate, but um, oftentimes you have monogamous species with receptors in these reward areas. What about humans? Are humans monogamous or not? So, I mean, I don't wanna make the argument that we're monogamous, but we do form bonds. We're maybe serially monogamous. Um, this is uh, transcriptomics data. Each dot represents an individual and so this is oxytocin receptor mRNA from human brains from the GTX database. And what you can see is that one of the highest levels of expression in the human brain is the nucleus accumbens. But also I want you to say, look how much individual variation there is in nucleus accumbens oxytocin receptors. So there's um, a lot, a wide variation in how much receptors are in the nucleus accumbens and as well as some of the other brain areas. And so that may give some uh, plasticity in social behavior across uh, humans as well. And I'll touch back on that in a minute. I just want to tell you about this um, one experiment that we did uh, in Japan. I um, have a collaboration there in Japan. And uh, looking at the species difference in receptor distribution, you know, with mice, you can do all kinds of really cool experiments where you can, you know, you have Cree and you can do different genetic manipulations and um, but they don't have receptors in the right place to be monogamous. So we thought, well, what if, what if we took the prairie vole oxytocin receptor gene, a bat clone that's got like 150,000 base pairs of regulatory sequence, 
and put that into a mouse. Uh, could we, and you can see like these key differences in the BLA, nucleus accumbens, anterior cingulate cortex and prefrontal cortex where mice and, and voles are just very different. Could we create a mouse that has a variable pattern of receptor? So we did that, we created these mice, we came out with about seven or eight different lines and uh, none of them were a perfect match to the vole. But what's really cool about this is that you have each different line has some aspects of the vole. So this is like the prairie vole prefrontal cortex. This is another one that has the nucleus accumbens expression. Each of the lines are very different in their expression. And that doesn't normally happen when you make back clones or black transgenics because back transgenics usually have enough regulatory sequence to give you faithful expression. And um, although, you know, at first I was disappointed in this result, I think it tells us something about this gene that depending on where it inserted in the mouse genome, it had a totally different expression pattern. Some elements conserved across, you know, with a vole pattern, but others that were very different. And some of this expression, it looks very much like vasopressin receptor patterns. So to me, it suggests that this receptor gene is very sensitive to micro changes in DNA sequence that then can uh, allow the receptor expression pattern to evolve. And that's where evolutionary plasticity of this system comes from. I'll show you another example of that later. So what does oxytocin really do? If you Google oxytocin, of course, you'll see it's the love hormone, the cuddle hormone. You might even see it's the moral molecule. Uh, but uh, I want to try to convince you something different today, that oxytocin is really about enhancing the salience and reinforcing value of social stimuli. It's about enhancing the processing of social information. And uh, so um, many years ago, when we start, first started studying oxytocin knockout mice, we found that they have social amnesia. They can't remember other mice that they've met before. Mice tell each other apart by smell, they sniff each other, and then they can recognize the odor that makes each mouse be unique. Um, but if they don't have oxytocin, they can't. So oxytocin is necessary for that. And this is a paper that uh, published by Wolfgang Kelch's group that illustrates how that works. When mice interact with each other, oxytocin is released into the anterior olfactory nucleus, which then increases the excitability of those neurons onto granule cells, which are inhibitory and that basically silences the noise. So this is just an illustration of maybe there's a lot of noise in the olfactory bulb, but when oxytocin comes by, the noise goes down and you get the real signal come through. So I think of oxytocin as being kind of like if you have a television screen with a video playing, but there's a lot of static. Normally there's just a lot of static. If you could turn a dial and have all the static go away, the, uh, the image comes through much clearer. And I think that's what's happening in the brain, not only in the olfactory bulb, but uh, Robert Frumke has shown that the same thing is happening in an auditory cortex, um, as well as other areas too. I think it's a common theme. Um, it's helping the flow of information of high integrity social information throughout the brain. So oxytocin's, I think is, its role in pair bonding is really in the perception of social stimuli getting that clear neural encoding of individuals and social cues. But it's great work done by Sushin Wang at Florida State University. He, he was at Emory before, uh, showing that dopamine is also important. D2 receptors are critical for this pair bonding. If you block the D2 receptors, the animals can't form bonds. And we've also shown that opiates are important. If you block the mu opioid receptor, they don't form bonds. So it's really not just one chemical, that it is sort of a, a chemical cocktail acting in the brain to create a bond. And um, let, so dopamine, as you know, is involved in reinforcement learning um, and oxytocin is involved in the perception of social stimuli. And this is what I think is happening in an animal when it mates. If this was a vole, it would be forming a bond. If it's a rat, it's not. So let's, let's pretend that this is a rat. He, uh, a male rat is mating for the first time. At first, he doesn't know exactly how to mate, but when he is finally successful, that somatosensory stimulation comes in from the genitals, activates the DTA, and dopamine is released in the prefrontal cortex and nucleus accumbens, and that's what makes sex rewarding. So we know sex is rewarding even in rats because you can, a, a rat will press a lever many times to get a female rat to drop out of the ceiling. 
so that they can mate. But when that animal mates and that dopamine is released, that rat says, wow, that was great. Who was I with? Uh, it's with a female that's in estrus and then he spends the rest of his life trying to recreate this chemical event by searching out females in estrus. But prairie voles, uh, they also have that release of dopamine, but they're also taking in the scent of the, the partner that they're with. And because they're having that, uh, the oxytocin is involved in the perception of social cues and the identity of individuals, social recognition, that animal says, wow, who is that? It's not just a female, but which female is it? And then neural connections, synaptic plasticity, uh, I think occurs in the nucleus accumbens to make that partner become inherently rewarding. And remember, this happens in both males and females. Okay. So here's another uh, a view, uh, a illustration of, of what I think oxytocin is doing. If you have a male a rat, uh, he's mating, his brain is perceiving the scent of the female in estrus. It's different from a male, the scent of a male. And then the, with the dopamine, he, uh, helps him learn that this is the, who he should be looking for. And uh, the, he associates that scent of a female in estrus with that reward and he seeks out females in estrus. But because prairie voles have this high density of oxytocin receptors in the nucleus accumbens and prefrontal cortex, as well as BLA um, and hippocampus, they are able to form an association with a particular individual. So this individual becomes rewarding, inherently rewarding. And that's, that's where the partner comes from. Uh, um, so the neural encoding of the partner gets uh, ingrained into the brain's reward system. So if you wanna read more about our current thinking about the neural circuitry of pair bonding, we published this Nature Reviews Neuroscience that uh, puts together a lot of different pieces into one uh, big story. Um, but this is an experiment that was, that gave us some additional insight into what oxytocin is doing. This is a kind of an old school FOSS study where we wanted to give uh, oxytocin receptor antagonist or not a CSF and allow the animals to mate. And then we would see what parts of the brain were activated. We thought we could see some areas where if you don't have oxytocin receptor signaling, you would see less activation. And to our surprise at first, we found that no, when an animal mates, lots of these brain areas become activated and uh, there was no group differences in uh, the uh, level of activation. But when we looked at it a little bit different way, we did something that's kind of like functional connectivity to see how the activation in one area correlated with the activation in another area. Um, we found something interesting. So this is an animal that's just sitting in a cage by itself. We took the brain and then stained for FOSS. And you can see this is a, a heat matrix. Uh, red means they're highly correlated. Blue means they're not correlated, uh, anti-correlated. Um, not much going on there, but if you let an animal mate, boom, the whole brain becomes very highly correlated. If there's a lot of activity in the FOSS, there'll be a lot of, sorry, if there's a lot of activity in the medial amygdala, there'll also be a lot in the nucleus accumbens and the prefrontal cortex. Uh, but if you block the oxytocin receptors with the antagonist, I see the antagonist, that correlated activity goes away. So one interpretation of this is that, you know, oxytocin is facilitating communication across all these different brain areas that allows that social signal to come in from the olfactory bulb into the amygdala, into the prefrontal cortex, into the nucleus accumbens, and into the hippocampus and other areas where it can do something with that information, like create a bond. So uh, this is why I, I sort of think of oxytocin as like the grease of the social brain. It helps the flow of information across the brain and then allows you to do something important with that. And uh, this is also from that uh, Nature Reviews Neuroscience where we, we talk about pair bonding in the context of social engrams. We know that in mice, they have groups of cells that encode for individuals from Tanagawa's work, Okayama. Uh, so I imagine that the same sort of thing is happening in voles so that a pair bond is basically results from neuroplasticity that links the neural encoding of the partner's cues, the odor uh, in an engram 
with the brain's reward system. And that is what I think is the essence of a pair bond. Something like this, another way to visualize it, when an animal, two animals are, are, are mating or when they're interacting, you have the social information is coming through the BLA and hippocampus and projecting to the nucleus accumbens, but nothing special is happening yet. But when they mate, you have the dopamine coming from the VTA and the oxytocin from the PVN, and that actually allows them to form uh, stronger synapses with the nucleus accumbens so that the cells that represent that individual are hardwired into the nucleus accumbens and um, you have a social engram uh, in the reward system. So this is just our model that we're using to, to test you know, for future experiments. Um, we're doing some electrophysiology and seeing some of this happening. Um, so that's what I think a pair bond is. Let's talk about some other aspects of this work. Um, so I'm in a department of psychiatry. So sometimes I have to do things that are really directly relevant to psychiatry. And this is an experiment where we looked at how early life neglect uh, affected later life pair bonding ability. So this was done by Katie Barrett, who was a grad student in the lab a few years ago. She took these little pups and for the first two weeks of life, she gave them uh, social isolation. So they were in these warm chambers. They were not cold. They just didn't have physical contact with the siblings or the parents. And she did this for three hours a day for the first two weeks of life. So after two weeks, she just raised them normally. And then she wanted to see if they had an impaired ability to bond as adults. And she found that that was the case. These are the time spent with partner and the stranger of animals that were controlled, not neglected. And then these are the animals that experienced the neglect. And she found this, this was no longer statistically significant. So early life social environment can influence how you can bond later in life. Now you may be looking at this and say, wait, it looks like there's an effect there. It's just not statistically significant. And in fact, it, that is the case. Um, when she looked at um, these individuals and this early stress group, she found that about half of the animals could form pair bonds just fine. The other half could not. So some animals were susceptible to this early life neglect so that later in life, they wouldn't form a pair bond and others were resilient. So she asked, where does this resilience come from? And it turns out that perivoles, not, not only do you have the big species differences that I told you about before, even within perivoles, you have a high degree of individual variation, particularly in the nucleus accumbens, not so much in other areas. So here's the amygdala is the same between these two animals. This is VMH is the same, but the nucleus accumbens, there's a lot of individual variation. And um, it turns out that that predicts whether the animals will be able to form a bond if they have the high density of receptors, the animals can form bonds even if they experience neglect. But if they have the low level of receptors, these animals, if they experience neglect, they can't form bonds later in life. And I just wanna make the point that the social isolation isn't changing the receptor density in this area. These animals are born with either high levels or low levels or intermediate levels. Um, and then whatever density of receptors they have determines how the early life uh, experience is going to shape their brain. And uh, so what we observed is that when we put the pups back in with the mom and dad, the mom and dad would always lick those pups. And uh, we did some uh, immediate early gene staining and found that that licking causes uh, activation of oxytocin neurons. So what we think is happening is when they come back with their parents, they get the lick and grooming that releases the oxytocin into the nucleus accumbens. And if they have high densities of receptors there, they get a lot of signaling. These animals get less and then these animals can recover. So, um, so that early life nurturing behavior can release oxytocin, which can then shape the brain. And um, let's see. I mean, I just want to, okay, yeah, I'm going to make the point in humans, there's evidence that uh, the same thing happens. Ruth Feldman did a study where she took fathers and let them uh, interact with uh, babies, their infants, and they gave them fathers intranasal oxytocin. And they found that the fathers that got oxytocin 
got more eye to eye contact and more reciprocal interactions with their babies. They also had higher levels of salivary oxytocin, but they measured the oxytocin in the babies. And if the baby's father got oxytocin, the babies had higher levels of oxytocin as well. So it's that engagement of the parent with the child is releasing early life oxytocin, which can then shape the brain. So again, I was interested in this. Where does this individual variation comes from? This is a huge amount of variability for a within species. You don't see this kind of variability in mice and rats. And um, basically we did some uh, allelic expression imbalance work and found out that there is a SNPs in the oxytocin receptor gene that in our colony predict 80% of the variation in expression. So these SNPs are affecting expression in the striatum, but not in other brain areas like the amygdala. Um, so for example, I'm showing you this one SNP here that we can genotype animals and we can predict if they're gonna be high expressors or low expressors to a high degree of accuracy. Um, but in our colony, there are several other SNPs that are in LD with these SNPs. So we don't know which SNP is actually affecting expression. So there's one of my uh, grants uh, uh, now is using ATAC-seq and CHIP-seq to try to identify which ones of these SNPs are in areas that are likely to be regulatory sequences that are open chromatin, uh, which then we can go in with CRISPR maybe and change one SNP from one SNP to another SNP uh, and see if we can change expression. So I think this is a really great model of seeing how subtle variations in gene can have a profound effect on expression. This goes back to that mouse the Japanese mouse story I told you before, where we made these different lines, all with the same sequence, but they had really different expression patterns. Uh, so this, this gene is somehow very sensitive to changes to give diversity in expression. We've also recently done some uh, RNA scope and seizure hybridization of, because we know that there's dopamine D1 receptors and D2 receptors in the nucleus accumbens, as well as oxytocin receptors. And we find that, um, so the green ones are D2 cells, the red ones, no, sorry, the D, green ones are D1 receptor cells, the red ones are D2 receptor cells, and the white is oxytocin receptor. And you can see in the, the high genotype animals, uh, they're still expressing in the D2, or they're, they're expressing in both D2 and D1 cells but the low expressing genotype still is expressing in D2, but basically not in D1 cells. So this genetic polymorphisms affects oxytocin receptor expression specifically in D2, D1 cell, D1 dopamine neurons. And so um, I think that's a pretty cool mechanism to get diversity. So we can study other behaviors besides just pair bonding in these voles. We've done some collaboration uh, work with Franz de Waal who is interested in empathy, mostly in chimpanzees and other primates, but we wanted to look at, to see if the voles would show empathy-like behavior. And our reason was is that since these guys are monogamous and the female is usually always pregnant, you would expect that the male would have evolved a behavior to live together uh, to detect when the partner is distressed and then try to do something to relieve that distress because the, if the partner is distressed, then that those court levels could having a could be having a negative impact on the de developing offspring. So um, James Burkett, who was the first author of this, now at the University of Toledo, came up with this behavioral paradigm to look at consolation behavior. So basically, you take animals that are paired; they could be siblings or they could be partners, uh, and then either have give them a 20 minute separation so that they just go, they sit in another cage or stress them out so give them a foot shock and a tone combination of which was would stress them out and then put them back together and see what they did and um, so here we're dropping the female back in the cage and on this left side the animals received no stress oops And the other side, the male was, the female was stressed. And you can see that in both cases, the male approaches, 
But then on the unstressed female side, he just goes back to exploring the cage. But you can see that, that the male who is, whose partner was received the, the, the stressor, uh, it's much more interested and he spends a lot more time licking and grooming her. And um, that grooming actually decreases her stress levels. His stress hormone levels, his glucocorticoid or corticosterone uh, matches hers. If she's really stressed, then he has a higher level. Um, and that's a feature of empathy. Um, so this is what the data looks like when you, you graph it out, quantify it and graph it out. And uh, what we found is that mates do it to each other. Siblings will do it to each other, but they won't do it to a stranger. So they have to know that there's a familiarity, familiarity bias. So if it's an individual that they know, they will do it. Uh, even if it's an unrelated individual uh, that they've lived together, they will show this consoling behavior. Um, so we were interested in looking at the neural mechanisms of that. Um, but this, the fact that they don't do it to strangers tells you it's not just a chemosensory uh, stimulus. Uh, there's more to it. Metal voles don't do it. So the metal voles that are not monogamous, if you stress their partner out, they don't show any of this consoling behavior. Then we thought, well, maybe since, you know, parental care, maternal care is really probably the origin of empathy, right? Consoling pups. Mothers will, if their pups are in distress, they will console them. Um, so maybe this is similar. We wanted to see if oxytocin is involved in this. And indeed, if you block the oxytocin receptors with an oxytocin receptor antagonist, uh, the males won't show this consoling behavior towards their female. So something about oxytocin is making them either detect the, part, the fact that the partner is stressed out or be motivated to engage in this consoling behavior. So we wanted to know where it was acting. We did some FOSS studies so that we could look at uh, activation of brain areas when they, the males see their partner in distress. So they don't see them get shocked, but they see them on the other side and, and stressed out and they can smell them. And we could see that the anterior cingulate cortex was activated. And that is an area that in humans is activated when you see someone else in pain um, from fMRI studies. So um, we just infuse oxytocin receptor antagonists into the anterior cingulate cortex and showed that we could completely block this empathy-based consoling behavior, not if we injected the same drug into the prelimbic cortex, which we know is involved in pair bonding. So it's, it's a different um, behavior. But um, this, again, is another example of where the neural circuitry that's involved in maternal care or the neurochemistry that's involved in maternal care can be adapted for other uh, processes. We also wanted to look at what happens when they lose their partner, because we know in humans, if someone is in a long-term relationship and they lose their partner, it can cause increased incidence of depression, cardiovascular disease, um, decreased immune function, lots of both physical and mental health problems by losing a partner. Probably we all know someone who have been in a long-term relationship and when one of the partners dies, it's not long before the other one passes away as well. So we wanted to see if we could study that in these voles. And this was work done by Oliver Bosch in my lab. Um, he's at University of Regensburg in Germany. So we took animals and we either put two males together, so they were siblings, or we put a male and a female together. And then they could stay, to, they stayed together for five days. So this is long enough time for them to form a bond. And then we either took them away from their partner or took their partner away, or we let them stay paired. In this case, they were either separated from their brother or they remained paired with their brother. So this guy is socially isolated and this was socially isolated from the partner. And then we tested them on tests that are, are relevant to depressive-like behavior, um, passive coping test. So uh, we did forced swim test or tail suspension test 
So the four swim tests, we count how much time they're immobile, they're just floating. And uh, that passive behavior uh, is probably relevant to depressive-like behavior. And what we find is that if they're separated for the four days from their partner, they spend much more time just floating in this uh, four swim test. If they're separated from their sibling, it's no, no, no big deal. This is the tail suspension test. Hold them up by their tail and see how much time they write or just hang there. If they've lost their partner, you hold them up by their tail, they just hang there. If they've separated from their sibling, they don't. So uh, something happens when the animal forms this bond so that then when they're away from that partner, they show depressive-like behavior. And we also showed that their adrenal glands get larger. There's a CRF activation in the brain um, as well when they are, uh, lose their partner. But we found that those CRF receptors are on oxytocin neurons and that CRF activation actually inhibits oxytocin neurons from releasing oxytocin. And, um, and in fact, if we when we separate the partner, infuse, micro-infuse oxytocin directly into the nucleus accumbens, you can completely rescue this depressive-like phenotype from social loss. So uh, it's as though when they lose their partner, there's a withdrawal of oxytocin. And that withdrawal of oxytocin causes depressive-like behavior. If we give an oxytocin receptor antagonist and let them stay with their partner, they, they show an increase in this um, depressive-like behavior. So um, it's very much kind of like addiction. Um, you know, I think pair bonding is like an addiction to your partner. Um, and then like with addiction, when you're uh, away from your drug, you don't have the drug, it creates a sort of a negative affect. And uh, so that, that seems to be maladaptive. Why would an animal evolve this mechanism so that if their partners die, they become passive? And um, I, I happen to think that this is actually an adaptive strategy to maintain the bond in animals where the partner isn't dead, but they're just separated from their partner. So uh, I think all of us here know that um, we, in relationships, the quality of relationship changes over time. If you think back to the, when you first fell in love with someone, there was a lot of dopamine going on. You could stop thinking about your partner. It's a lot of reward. It's kind of like being on crack. Uh, you know, there's the lots of dopamine and your brain is building connections, um, linking the partner to the reward system. But that changes with time. Um, over a number of years, you don't get the same excitement. It reminds me of, my, of me and my wife, um, where uh, this was when me and my wife first got married about 14, 15 years ago. At the same time, we also got a puppy. And every day in the beginning, when I would come home from work, both my wife and my puppy would be uh, excited to see me when I come through the door. Uh, 14 years later, this is my wife, and my puppy is still very excited to see me when I come through the door. But my, the, the, uh, my wife is, doesn't show quite so much excitement. And that's because what's holding us together is not the dopamine anymore, but it is actually something else. So I think that this tells us something about um, what I call the yin and yang of social bonding. In the very beginning, you have the dopamine that's making those connections with the reward system. And it's that combination of the oxytocin with that dopamine that helps you build an addiction to your partner. Building addiction. Right, building addiction to your partner. Um, but then there's also when you're away from your partner. If you've ever traveled for a couple of weeks and been away from your partner, you start feeling this negative affect. And it's that negative affect is what um, keeps bringing the partners back together. In the prairie, well, in the prairie, you know, a, a male could go off and uh, when he goes to forage and just keep on going and find another female. But there's something uh, drawing him back to his partner. So um, I think that this is, says something interesting about the parallels of addiction and and bonding. So. Um, now, so um, voles are very cool from, in terms of their behavior, but they've always had some limitations in terms of uh, 
uh, not having the genetic tools to be able to do some of the things that you can do in mice. First of all, you know, create knockouts, but also do Cree experiments where you can do cell type specific manipulations. And that's always why mice have been so much more powerful. Uh, just recently, we started taking advantage of CRISPR uh, to uh, make some new tools in, in voles as well as in Madaka fish. There's a, I'm not going to talk about it today, but a uh, cool paper on mate choice in Madaka fish from oxytocin receptor knockout. But we've actually been able to generate oxytocin receptor knockout prairie voles now. And um, so these are whole body of knockouts. And we were very excited when we created them, but then we realized, well, these are just knockout, like knockout mice. But they had some interesting behavior, surprising behavior. Uh, we thought, of course, that the, the knockout prairie voles would not have, be able to show a partner preference. And although this group is not significantly different from this group, I don't think these two groups are different from each other. And so surprisingly, they seem to be able to still show a partner preference. And to me, that tells me that the circuitry involved in the partner preference is present. Even if oxytocin receptor is not there, oxytocin receptor is a neuromodulator of that circuitry. And maybe if they're born and they go through their entire development without any oxytocin receptor, uh, there's some sort of compensation that happens that allows them that circuit to function even in the absence of, of pair bonding. Um, but we looked at also this consoling behavior and that completely was knocked out. So some behaviors are really dependent on the oxytocin receptors. Others, maybe there's some chance of some um, compensation in some way. So we're interested now in, in pursuing this. Uh, we've also developed CRISPR viral vector. So we can now using CRISPRs in AAV get really robust knockdown of oxytocin receptors so that we can change the receptor in adults. Um, so we're doing those experiments now as we speak. The other thing that I'm really excited about is that we've been able to, this knockout work has been done by Kingo Hori, who is a postdoc in my lab now. Uh, he was able to make oxytocin receptor iris Cree voles and uh, by injecting the retrograde AAV into the nucleus accumbens, he could identify where are all the places that oxytocin receptor neurons are that project to the nucleus accumbens. So we can you know, work out the network of this um, oxytocin receptor connections. And uh, now we can be able to do like optogenetic manipulations of only the oxytocin receptor neurons that project to the nucleus accumbens, for example. Uh, so that's that's where we're going um, with these animals. But um, just to sort of relate this back to humans, um, you know, people always want to know, you know, are these voles in love? And what is the difference between a pair bond and love? And I don't think that these animals are in love. Um, they are they're showing a pair bond, but I think love requires the same kind of neural circuitry and the same kind of events uh, as underlying this pair bonding. So, you know, love is special. It's something that's probably uniquely human because it allows us, you know, we, we have the cognitive capacity to think about our partners and think about the future and think in language and things like that that animals don't have. But I just make this point because behaviors like empathy and love uh, that we think of as being uniquely humans, they have um, evolutionary antecedents in animals and the circuitry to do the, some fundamental aspects of those behaviors are present in animals and we can learn something um, from these animals about the circuitry. So uh, animals have basic fundamental underlying neural mechanisms that cause them to engage in behaviors similar to what we do. Emotions like love and compassion are elaborations of ancient neurobiological processes that can be studied in animals. And I'll show you some examples of that. Again, this is my wife, Ann Murphy. And I'm showing you this to uh, illustrate this study that was done by Rene Herleman's group in Germany, where they took men who were in monogamous relationships and uh, showed them photographs of either their partner or another female who 
a bunch of college students ranked as being equally attractive as the partner. Okay, so if I look at my partner and I say, well, my partner is a seven, or uh, they would show another uh, person that was a seven. And they gave these men oxytocin, intranasal oxytocin. Uh, and then they asked them to rank how attractive their, the people in the pictures were. And what they found is that if they gave men oxytocin and showed them pictures of their partner, they rated them more attractive than if they got placebo. So the oxytocin actually made them perceive their partner as being more attractive, but it did not make other women be perceived as uh, more attractive. So it was specific for the partner. And they did this in a brain scanner so they could see what parts of the brain were activated by the oxytocin plus being seeing the partner. And they found these two little areas here, this ventral striatum were, were lit up when the person received oxytocin and viewed their partner compared to the other conditions. And those two little areas are the same areas, the nucleus accumbens that I've been talking about is involved in pair bonding in voles. So um, I, I just show this because it, it seems that some of the mechanisms that are underlying, you know, vol bonding may be happening in humans as well. I want to go a little bit further into human. There's lots and lots of studies now giving intranasal oxytocin to people and seeing what it does. And um, I'm a little bit skeptical about a lot of those because the effect sizes are, are usually very small. Okay. And the, the samples are not usually large enough. But there are some effects that have been seen repeatedly, like, for example, it increases the amount of time looking into the eyes of others. It increases the ability to read the emotions of others. Um, face recognition, emotion recognition, attraction to partner. And now there's also a lot, a, a number of studies showing that intranasal oxytocin may have some positive effects in rescuing social deficits in autism. And I think that whatever effect it's having, it's having because of the fundamental uh, processes that oxytocin are affecting. And that is the salience of social stimuli and the reinforcing value of social stimuli. So if you have a disorder like autism, uh, maybe social stimuli are not that salient. They're not that reinforcing. But if you could use, if you could tap into this, these properties of oxytocin, you might be able to have some positive impact on the um, social behavior. I want to, um, you may also think, well, we've been talking about rodents and smell and odors and things like that. Primates don't use that. They're primarily visual. And it's kind of interesting that if you look at the olfactory areas of a rodent, there may be species differences in where the receptors are, but re oxytocin receptors tend to be in areas that are involved in olfactory processing. If you look at primates though, oxytocin receptors tend to be in areas that are involved in visual stimuli, processing visual stimuli. So that makes sense. It, so it, it's uh, receptors are in different places in different species. Uh, but depending on where they're, uh, what modalities they use. Um, we've been doing some intranasal oxytocin studies in humans um, in autistic subjects uh, in the last few years. And, you know, one of the interesting things that we find is that in autistic sub uh, subjects, there is a decrease in connectivity between the uh, salience network that includes the anterior cingulate cortex and the uh, insular cortex with the visual cortex. So autistic subjects have less functional connectivity between these areas. But if you give people with autism oxytocin, you re-establish that connection. So this gives you an, a circuit-based mechanism by which you know oxytocin may be useful. But there's still some skepticism on my part because most of the effects are very small. This is a typical study the shift in red, so the black is placebo, the reds are oxytocin, and this is on uh, social responsiveness scale scores. And you can see a little shift, but it's not really robust. It's not having a huge effect. And I think that's primarily because one, you're not really getting very much oxytocin into the brain intranasally. And second, these studies typically give oxytocin just in the morning and in the evening not associated with anything. And I don't think that that makes any sense. Um, so I think that in the, in the future, we, we have to go beyond oxytocin. If you think about in psychiatry, we don't use 
for any drug, are we using the brain's endogenous molecule? So we don't use, we don't give people that are depressed serotonin. We give them SSRIs. Uh, and so I'm thinking that we need to think about the same kind of approach in for the oxytocin system that, you know, maybe there are receptors on oxytocin neurons that there are drugs out there that could um, activate those neurons that can cross the blood-brain barrier. And then you could get robust oxytocin release in the brain. So one, one drug that does that is ecstasy. Um, but there are other drugs as well. And uh, I'll just tell you about one that we have been using. I don't think this is necessarily going to be a treatment for autism, but I think it makes the principle that um, it's a melanocortin agonist causes local release of oxytocin into the PVN, which then primes those PVN neurons so that when another stimulus comes to stimulate oxytocin release, you get a much more robust release of oxytocin. So you're essentially enhancing oxytocin release. And if we give that to the voles, we can induce a strong pair bond without having to inject them with oxytocin. They're inducing endogenous oxytocin release. And also that effect is that pair bond endures so that means that social information that is learned during exposure to this oxytocin-like drug causes synaptic plasticity that then is maintained. And even weeks after that, that social information is um, held. So I think that that suggests that by maybe targeting the oxytocin system with new drugs that can pass the blood brain barrier and not giving the oxytocin just in the morning and in the evening, but coupling it with a behavioral therapy so that you're making this child uh, social stimuli be more salient and more reinforcing during the time of this therapy. Behavioral therapies we know works, but if we could amp up this oxytocin system, maybe the behavioral therapies would work even better. So that's, that's where we are, I think, with oxytocin treatments and, and autism and, um, I just wanted to uh, give a little uh, shout out to this paper because it was just accepted yesterday of my graduate student, MD, PhD, who was thinking about how is a circuit-based neuroscience that we can do in animals uh, going to improve psychiatry? You know, uh, the psychiatry that we do today is just giving a drug that hits all over the brain, lots of different brain areas, and that's the prob problem why it doesn't work so well. But maybe we can get smarter and target specific circuits by combining kinds of behavioral therapies with drugs and get a much more surgical precision medicine based approach for treating some of these psychiatric disorders. So this paper will come out in uh, current opinions in neurobiology in the next few days. So I'm going to stop there. And uh, so most of our funding comes from National Institute of Mental Health. And I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thanks, Larry. That was that was fascinating. Um, let me ask one one question. So, uh, as you pointed out, um, humans are particularly visual. Um, how well do we form pair bonds across Zoom? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't tried that yet. But that sounds like a good experiment to do. <laughs> Go ahead, Megan. Uh, hi, thank you so much for that talk. It was very interesting. Um, I just had a quick question about um, if you could expound a little bit upon the differences between like a pair bond and a social bond. And uh, just because I was thinking about what you presented in the beginning about how the oxytocin, the impetus for the oxytocin release is the like mating event. Um, but then throughout the presentation, you kind of showed how so like sibling versus partner bonds are different in terms of the effect on like losing that partner, but they're like similar in terms of like empathy expression. Um, so I was kind of just wondering about like what other impetuses you see oxytocin forming other types of bonds as yeah. opposed to the pair bond. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think mating is special because it, it stimulates the release of both dopamine and oxytocin at the same time. Okay, maybe very powerfully. Uh, but there was a paper out from Valerie Krinovich's group uh, just in Nature Neuroscience just a few weeks ago, showing that when female rats interact with each other and they touch each other, so it's that, you know, social touch was in the title of the paper, that's causing oxytocin neurons to be activated. So, you know, I think that the pair bond is that, is that magic that happens with dopamine 
plus the partner social cues. But oxytocin is, is released during many other kinds of social interactions. So another example is um, this work on oxytocin and uh, human dog bonding. Uh, when dogs look into the owner's eyes, uh, the, the uh, owner gets a release of, dopam of oxytocin. And also when the human looks at the dog, if they make a connection, uh, the dog has oxytocin release. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, it happens in many cases, scenarios where you need to, you need to turn down, turn down the dial on the static and really get high quality social information. That's, that's what the oxytocin is doing. And that, that can happen in a lot of cases. So I, I think it's probably involved in friendships as well as other kinds of bonds, but they are different in some way. Carlos. Thanks, Paul. Um, great talk. At the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that you were able to introduce regulatory elements of oxytocin into mice and you showed patterns of expression that were sort of reminiscent of the, what you see in the prairie voles, but you never told us if they become monogamous socially or what happens to those guys. Yeah, so we're doing those experiments now. Um, so we had to get rid of the mouse's endogenous oxytocin receptor. So breed them into the uh, an oxytocin receptor knockout mice. And as we speak, we are, we're taking some of the interesting patterns, like one has lots of receptors in the nucleus accumbens, others have prefrontal cortex. And uh, we are doing the partner preference testing on those. And I mean, our first pass, we, we do see a partner preference, but um, I don't, I didn't want to show that because I'm afraid it can go away, <laughs> you know, um, as we do more animals, but um, that's, that's the plan. So cool. Thank you. Uh, Charlene. Hi. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I've had this question for a while now because uh, I first heard about this work through documentaries that were done about a decade on like PBS and Discovery Channel and such. But at the time, the way that they represented sort of the dichotomy between prairie voles and the meadow voles was they were talking about this dichotomy between, and this might not be, you know, really what has panned out, but they were talking about it as a dichotomy between vasopressin and oxytocin. And I guess one of the things that I did notice about some of the work that you're presenting is that oxytocin seems to have different effects when you're talking about strangers versus people who you are already, you already have some kind of pre-established social right. bond with. In group so just, versus out groups. Right. So I'm just sort of curious, like as far as um, your work is concerned, have you found that, um, you know, vaso, like have you found that vasopressin might be a better avenue to approach sort of more like casual social connections? that a person with autism might face on a regular basis as opposed to like the oxytocin pathway where in truth, we only form close bonds with a few select people in our lives. Right, so like I said, you know, oxytocin is involved in, it's, it's more than just forming bonds. It is being able to remember another person, paying attention to facial expressions, uh, reading emotions and, and things like that. So it's just, it's the dial of removing the static. Um, the, so vasopressin is important in pair bonding in males um, and I think that that comes from the, its ancestral role in territoriality. In hamsters and in other species, vasopressin increases social vigilance. So it makes you be, be uh, you know, aggressive to protect your partner, show mate guarding behavior. It's anxiogenic. Oxytocin has evolved more from the maternal behavior, which is more nurturing, calming, anxiolytic. So that's why, in my opinion, I, I, I sort of stop doing vasopressin receptor stuff because I didn't really see the um, translational, it, it didn't seem like it was going to be as good for treating autism, but there are some papers out there now that say that I was wrong, but uh, so it should be studied more, but yeah. And, and also the out group in group thing is if you think of a, uh, like people often think oxytocin is like a hug molecule, right? A cuddle hormone. And it's not, it, it, um, makes you make social decisions correctly, adaptive social decisions. So in a wildebeest, oxytocin is released when a lion comes and that, you know, if a, in a wildebeest who has a mother and if a lion comes to try to get the baby, oxytocin is released and causes there to be maternal aggression. So there's a lot of work on maternal aggression and oxytocin. Um, so, you know, it, it, acting in different areas, it can have different things. So. I don't think of it as a bonding molecule in certain contexts when dopamine is present and 
you know, it is involved in bonding, but it's really about, it's the grease of the social brain, I think. Um, Jim, do you want to ask your questions? Jim McCracken? As he left, if, if he's gone, let me sure. ask his. Sure. There you are. Um, I, uh, thanks very much for your, your talk, Dr. Young. It was really fantastic. Um, regarding the, the co-expression of D1 and D2 receptors on uh, oxytocin neurons, uh, do you think, or do, do we know if they, they're excitatory or inhibitory? Um, well, that probably, they probably are inhibitory. Most of the neurons in the um, nucleus accumbens are inhibitory and about 75% of neurons express oxytocin receptor there. So, um, so, they're, so they're inhibitory to the ventral pallidum. They're pro projecting to the ventral pallidum. They also project to a lot of other, other places as well. But um, the one model that I've sort of been thinking about is that uh, the nucleus accumbens is inhibitory to the, to the ventral pallidum. And if you, uh, D2 receptors, I believe, are inhibitory of the inhibitory neurons. So it would be releasing the break. Something like that. Thank you. And, and uh, what are the effects of gonadal hormones on um, uh, oxytocin neurons? Well, um, it's, this is also species specific. So in rats, uh, oxytocin receptors in the VMH are very highly estrogen dependent or testosterone dependent. Um, so give testosterone, they go sky high. Uh, but if you give in mice, it's the opposite in the VMH, the same brain area, uh, estrogen and testosterone suppress oxytocin receptors. And in voles, we don't see any regulation. Well, the only place that's regulated, oxytocin receptors are regulated is the anterior olfactory nucleus. And that's involved in social recognition. And that makes sense because when the animal comes into estrus reproductive age, they have a heightened levels of oxytocin receptors there that will help them uh, discriminate other individuals. Um, and in terms of the oxytocin neurons themselves, uh, I don't think it has that much of an effect. Thank you. Um, uh, Caitlin, Caitlin Goodpaster, you'd like to ask your question? Sure. Um, I was just wondering back in your model of the oxytocin knockout um, voles, where they still showed the partner preference if that was due to vasopressin. I don't know if you just didn't want to get into it because vasopressin is a whole nother thing, but I was just wondering. Yeah, it could be. Um, you know, we were surprised when we made oxytocin receptor knockout mice many years ago, thinking that they were not going to be maternal, they could still be maternal. So uh, these are oxytocin knockout. So it could be vasopressin or I really don't have any evidence for any mechanism over another mechanism at this point though, but it, it's kind of surprising. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, Frank Mellitz. I, I can ask his question. Um, uh, can you expand a little bit about whether addiction is a disease or a dysregulation? Um, well, I guess I'm not the best person to ask about addiction. I don't, that's not the main thing that I study. So I don't, I'm not sure, not sure what all the arguments are, but I, I do know that, you know, um, our brain systems that are involved in addiction did not evolve to become addicted to substances like, uh, cocaine or heroin, or, you know, those were just not there. So those the addiction systems evolve for other things. And, you know, maybe pair bonding is an example of one. Um, so there's adaptive things that they can do. And um, yeah, I, I, I just, um, I think addiction probably is a disease, a maladaptive disease that uh, is caused by an adaptive system that for, for use for other purposes. Um, Art Arnold is asking, Art, are you, can you want to ask your question? All right, I'll, I'll read it. Uh, can you comment on the difference between the males and females pair bond? What's the same and what's different? 
So one difference is the vasopressin system. Um, so uh, males are more likely to show, you know, heightened aggression towards other individuals. So that they, there's not, not only is there a bond, but then there's also selective aggression towards others. And females show a little bit of that too. Um, but um, I think that's probably the main difference. There may be other subtle things that, that, um, that are different, but not, not easily apparent. But uh, I think in both males and females, you have the core underlying oxytocin mechanism, which is kind of a nurturing kind of bond. And then for with males, you also have this vasopressin, which increases vigilance and sort of um, threat detection. So uh, we're, we're designing a new, um, new set of experiments to look at something that's maybe is related to jealousy. So we have animals pair bond. And then on the other side of a, a class, you have, we put the female partner and another male in there. And we see that the, the experimental male, you know, the, the male partner becomes very uh, excited and, you know, he's very concerned about that situation. And um, so that's a, an area that we're going to, that we're developing for the future. Um, Blake Madruga asks, what are your thoughts on sex specific oxytocin receptor expression profiles across the brain between males and females? So in ASD, autism spectrum disorder, how do you think these differences affect response to intranasal nasal administration of oxytocin under fMRI? Um, so Dan Geshwin, um, group there at UCLA, they have some interesting studies looking at uh, genetic polymorphisms that uh, affect functional connectivity. So genetic polymorphisms in the oxytocin receptor gene that affect functional connectivity differently in males and females. Um, so there's a, an example of a sex difference. That, um, so in voles, there's not really a sex difference in expression patterns. The, and I think that the um, you know, the, I don't think that a dysregulation in the oxytocin receptor is causing autism. Um, you know, I think there are, are, you know, lots of synaptic protein uh, genes that can be disrupted and to, to cause areas not to be able to communicate with each other efficiently. And that's what causes autism. Um, but I think that by activating oxytocin receptors, you can help it's like the grease of the social brain again. It sort of you can help that functional connectivity uh, be reestablished. Um, but you know, there's not a lot of imaging studies that that have male and female autistic subjects. Um, that's just an area that that needs to be looked at. Um, all right, I think we've gone a long time. Thank you very very much, Larry. I really appreciate it. it was a fantastic lecture. Um, your um, change in our um, relationship with our partners was very interesting and reminds me of a joke. If you want to know who loves you more, uh, put your spouse and a dog in the trunk of a car. Come back after an hour. Who's happy to see you? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah. thank you very much. Okay. It, was, it was a very, very interesting uh, session. Thank you all for attending. And... Um, Take care, stay well, be good. Okay, Bye. good to see you, see you all.